Right? What is the assurance that's given when Jesus ascends to heaven? He's coming back. He's coming back. So why were these men staring at him? They didn't think he was. <laughs> right? This is their and in their minds, this is their final look at Jesus. And so, you know, they were trying to get a good look at him as he is ascending and probably just amazed at the sight, right? How many people have you known that you've seen just magically ascend to heaven? Right? It, it's something that is very uncommon, especially in the in the Testament. But <clears throat> so they're gazing at Jesus as he is ascending. And so the assurance that we're... I had the example a few weeks ago about, you know, if you have a family member in, or maybe, and I didn't even mention this, but what if you have a kid that heads off to college, right? And, and I remember the first day that I went to college, you know, when, when I was leaving, I look up at the window, and who are the first two people staring at me that Friday or the week after that that I'm coming back? And so obviously they want to get that last look, and that's the same thing with these people here in this text. They wanted to get that last and final look. Well, Jesus, you mentioned here recently, John 14, about he said a lot of things in their presence during his earthly ministry, but it also said, like, it escapes me right now, but these, it says some of these things they didn't really fully comprehend until Christ was glorified. So there were certain things that their spiritual eyes just really couldn't see. But this really shouldn't have caught them off guard because he said, I'm going to go back to my father and he's going to prepare these places for them, you know, so that when he comes in, you know, and they'll go with him. So, but it's no different us today. We may read certain words of the Bible over and over and over. At least it's the way it's been for me. And I just couldn't get it. But all of a sudden, my eyes are open and I fully comprehend what the Holy Spirit intended by this right <coughs> That was the case, you know what I mean? Because these things also, even when they all scattered, when he was being tried, there was an arrest or like that. You know, that caught him off board. This kind of caught him off board. But, but, and we're no different than that. We think there's times where things happen when we don't get it, or maybe a particular study we're doing, we don't get it. But I think part of that goes when God sees us hungry and thirsty after his word, having our eyes open his word, that he opens that understanding. That's how I believe. Yeah, and, and when you go to that, you know, a lot of people, <clears throat> going back to what you just said, you know, we can say and try to teach things all we want, but how many times have you heard in your life, well, I'll believe it when I see you? How many times have you heard that? I've heard some giggles, so obviously I'm not the only one who's heard of it. You know, a lot of people, <clears throat> and I've had the same thing said to me when trying to preach the gospel, is that a lot of people will say, I'll believe it when I see it. And these two men could have been an example of that because you're talking in the text of John 14, 1 through 3 when he talks about the mansion and there's many rooms. You have to go, to get to it, you have to go through me. Right? So he, he has probably told them time and time again and you see it, you know, throughout the New Testament. There is not once but twice, but there's numerous times. You know, when we went over that lesson a few weeks ago about the second coming, how many passages did we read? Stating the same thing, right? I told you, I said a lot of these passages are just repeated. And that maybe that's why it was given so many times in text, because that just that just shows how many times they had to keep repeating it because not everybody was grasping by what Jesus was saying. And I I would assume that if they were grasping every single thing that Jesus said, he wouldn't have been rejected. He wouldn't have died, because they would have thought, you know, surely in their minds, they would have thought. Son of God, we're not killing him. But what did they do when they killed him? <clears throat> what was on his head? The crown of thorns. The crown of thorns. Why? They were mocking. They were mocking him. Right? No, not everybody believed him, and you see that. You know, they didn't just kill him, but they mocked him, saying, you know, here's the Son of God. Here's your crown of thorns. You know, it was just a big mockery. So not everybody was grasping. And accepting what Jesus said. But, and that's no different than these men right here. These could have been just, these could have been two guys that, you know, were, I believe it when I see people. And then when they see Jesus ascending to heaven, it's like, wow, he's telling the truth. So, 
That is the assurance that we're given in that first text of Acts 1, is that he's coming back. And when he comes back, that's it. So let's just be cautious of that uh, when we go on about our daily lives, because what is so important about his return? You know, when you look at the text in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, he talks about how some people are going to say, yeah, you knew me, and they'll be accepted. And some people he's going to say, you didn't know me. And so he's not just returning, but he's returning to, if you would, finish the job. Right? There's always been a set plan for since the beginning of time, since God created the heavens and the earth, there's always been that set plan, and so that's going to be when they finish the job. He settled on occasion on his first time. He said, I come not to judge the world. That's going to be in stark, stark contrast to what he's going to come the second time. He came the first time so he could die, you know, and then be buried in the resurrection. That's where this hope lies that we have. But he said, I didn't come to judge. Okay, but then he says, in John, he said, the word that I've spoken, that's what's going to judge people last time. His second words, if I understand it, is going to be for that final judgment. You know, right. that, that's, the, that's the contrast between his objective the first time was to bring about the plan of salvation, his objective the second time is to see who complied. Right. So, it, <clears throat> have you ever started a project and you had people working on that project? And when you left, you were wanting to come back and see what progress was made. You know, <clears throat> that's kind of the same thing here, right? Because when he comes down the first time to earth, he's doing it to save everybody. But not only to save, he is also trying to teach and see what we're going to be willing to do for ourselves. Right? It's not just, you know, with him dying on the cross, that's not just it, right? That's not... After that, he's saying, you know, we're free to do what we want because we're saved. Right? We have to save ourselves in that aspect. So that's kind of what he was doing. He was coming to teach and coming to save. And then the next time, it's like you said, you know, how do we, how do we, if you will, take advantage of the opportunities that he's given unto us? So if you would, let's go to Revelation 22. Revelation 22, and it says verse 20, but I kind of want to back up to verse 6 just to, just to get the whole context of this chapter because it goes into detail about the return of Jesus. So Revelation chapter 22, and we're going to start in verse 6. <clears throat> it says in verse 6, And he said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show servants what must take place. Verse 7, And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who have heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers the prophets and those who keep the words of this book worship God. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy for this book or of this book for the time is near. Let the evil doers still do evil, 
and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteousness and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. Verse 12, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. <clears throat> Blessed are those who wash their robes, so that they may have the right to the tree of the life, and they may enter the city of the gates. Outside of the dogs and the sorcerers, and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you the, about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright and the morning star. <clears throat> Verse 17, The Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let one who hears say, Come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take up the water of life without price. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and the holy city which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. Powerful text. Right? And I know that was a long text to read, but I just wanted to show the whole background of this, right? And here's the thing. A lot of people through the years have told me, when it comes to second coming, they said it's kind of scary just the way he says things. But I think of it as, <clears throat> have you ever taken, I'm sure most jobs have this, but have you ever had to take a test to get into a job? And you're waiting eagerly for those results. They could be really good, or they could be really bad. Right? So when you take that test, it's like when the person comes out, they've told you if you've gotten the job or not. Right? That's how some jobs work, some jobs are different, but... The main thing is, is that nobody is scared of that person. They're just nervous about what the results are. And so maybe that's the same with these people talking about the coming of Jesus. But I, I see it as a way to rejoice. Right? I see it as an honest and, you know, this is the best thing that would ever happen to us as Christians if we have kept his word that, you know, this text just talks about. Not adding to, not taking away, but doing and being believers and being followers of the word that has been provided to us. Right? And if we study this daily, you know, just like those tests, right? If you study that daily and you show those qualities that they're asking for, then you have nothing to worry about sometimes. Right? Well, that's the same thing here. You study this book, you get more knowledge of what the Lord has to say. Do what he says, and we'll be fine. Yes, sir. In verse 14, it says, Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and enter into the city of the gates. Talking about washing their robes, we're supposed to be clothed in righteousness. Have a white robe on. When we become a Christian, that, white, that robe that we have on is white. Until we sin, and that robe's got sin on it, and it's dirty. And we ask for repentance. We repent and ask for forgiveness. Our robes are clean again. So our whole life, what are we doing? We're doing laundry. We're washing our robes every day, <coughs> checking ourselves against the standard, making sure that what we are doing is right, so that we can be able to have that possibility to be in heaven to God. Right. And you see that, you know, just <coughs> when it comes to your clothes, right? Even just the smallest, like you just run for 10 minutes, you're going to have to wash those clothes again. That's just like sin when people think that once they sin, you know, they're, they're fine because they've already been saved. Right? And that's a, lot of, that's a lot of belief. But as you said, when we sin, we have to keep washing those clothes. We've got to make sure that we are clean. You know, because <clears throat> if our clothes are dirty... Do you think when we're trying to go to somebody else's house, do you think they're going to accept us in our home if, if we're dirty? Well, that's kind of the same thing with heaven, right? If we're washing our clothes daily, but then but then we sin and we get away from that, right? He's not going to 
accepts the one who is dirty in that sin. We have to keep doing that daily and make sure that we are consistent with our faith and with our works to Him, to please Him. Anything else before we move on to the next text? I think kind of like an extension of what Mike brought up there in Revelation chapter 3. Jesus is speaking to the church of Sardis. He said there's a few names there. It's kind of sad, but out of that assembly, there's a few names that hadn't defiled their garments. You know, like Mike said, after they did, they would have repented or whatever. And he said that they would walk with him in white. He goes on to say that the ones that wouldn't repent, what's he going to do? He's going to blot their name out of the book of life. So he would say, well, if you're saved, you could never do anything. Well, if your name isn't found in that book of life because our garments are spotted, then it looks to me like that's a text proof right there that, you know, obviously we have to, like you were referring to, try to keep those commandments. And if what Mike said, repent when we do fall short, that's the one that's going to get that eternal life. But I was just thinking when he brought that up, that some people say that once you come in desperation, there isn't anything you can do to fall. And so part of this blessed assurance, because that's pretty good blessed assurance by becoming a Christian, and I can never do anything, you know, to be, to fall away, you know what I mean, to be disqualified or whatever, but that would be, that would be pretty good assurance, but that's not really the way it works, but I hang my salvation on that doctrine. I stand before God, and he said, when you defied your garments, even after you became a Christian, you never made any attempt to rectify this, you know, depart from me, I never knew you. Time to figure that out is now. Yeah, and sometimes, and I want to put this in your head too, when some people, when they get dirty, have you seen in certain people with that kind of OCD mindset to when they get something dirty, and they're like, well, i got to wash that now. You know, i got to take care of that right now. Could you imagine if everybody was that same way toward their faith? Right? You know, when people sin, if they thought, you know, oh, I just did that against God. i got to make sure that I repent of this and try to change my ways, you know. It would be so encouraging if people, you know, chose to live their life in faith the same way that as you would if they got their clothes dirty and wanted to wash it immediately. You know, life would be a lot easier and it would be a lot more encouraging as Christians to see people and how dedicated they would be to the Lord in that manner. Right, he's gonna. He knows. If he's gonna create the heavens and the earth, he, he's gonna know what goes on inside of our minds. Yeah. Right. This is the this is the same being who created everything. This is the same one who helped David defeat Goliath. This is the same one who gave Solomon the wisdom that he needed. You know, nothing has changed. You see how powerful he is, and not only that. He's going to know why we do the things that we do and where our hearts are when we do everything in our lives. He knows that. And so that... <clears throat> no matter where we are, either. No matter where we are, and sometimes people... And with what you said, sometimes people will be like, well, the outside of me can be clean. Right? I'll show people <laughs> how good of a Christian I am, but once I'm in closed doors, I'm going to choose to... I'm going to choose to act in however way I want. I, I've seen that happen to people. And that goes along with what you said, because no matter what, no matter what goes on on the outside, <laughs> God's always going to know what's going on on the inside. Let's go to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. <laughs> going to go along with our next question and see. But it says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, 
which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. <clears throat> who is that? <clears throat> Paul. Right? And what does Paul say here? He's, he's ready, right? I have fought the good fight. I finished the race. That's just what we talked about Sunday morning, right? We talk about our whole lives and what we're doing throughout that process. It's like a race, right? And we're trying to get to that finish line, which is heaven. But we have to be patient because it's not just going to come today. Well, that's kind of what Paul is saying here. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. So do you think Paul had the perfect life? Paul said he left his body. I think he said daily, let's have teaching others, he himself being disqualified. And so that principle is true for us today. And sometimes we may be very young to think, we don't know this, but we think we have a lot of years to live. Maybe we do, maybe we don't, but we think, how am I going to keep all this right? But all we really have is today, as what Paul said, buff his body daily. So if our life, all the individual days, Okay, the total woes will make up a book. If we keep each of those individual days right, then at the end of our life, and some of those days which would be, you know, that would be our life on here, we keep the individual days right, okay, then the total of those will be right. But that's only going to be accomplished. If Paul had to buff his body, certainly all of us would too. And that's how it's accomplished. But if I look at it and say, I've got 50 years left, how am I going to keep my life right? It's kind of overwhelming when he said for me. We kind of dissect and say, hey, keep each of these individual days right. And when I do get it wrong, repent, get that burden cleaned up again. Then whenever, then when I get the end of all, if I can say, like Paul, you know, I'm going to be one of those that love and disappear. I think, to me, I derive a benefit when I approach it that way. Keep today right. And the more it gets in here, keep that right. Right. And <clears throat> you saying that just reminds me. So when my brother, my brother used to be a football coach in Haven City. And he had everywhere, everywhere, if it had win the day. And that that really opened up my eyes because anything that we do in our lives, we're thinking, we're probably thinking really far ahead, right? Like if we set goals and we're trying to achieve something, usually that's what gets me in trouble is I'm thinking of, well, it's going to take me six months to do this. It's going to take me a year to get this, to accomplish this. But as you said, when I started changing my mindset to let's focus on today, and, you know, we see the same thing when <clears throat> Jesus tells us to not worry about tomorrow because it brings its own times, right? And so worry about today, worry about being your best Christian self today. When tomorrow comes, we can focus on that tomorrow. But what we have to stop doing is looking toward the future because that's when patience kind of starts running a little thin, right? When you focus on what's going on the here and the now, you know, instead of focusing on the future, why don't I focus on being the best Christian I could be this moment? Because tomorrow's not what? It's not guaranteed. I could try to look for next year all I want, but if tomorrow's not guaranteed, what's that going to do for me if I'm focusing on the future, and if that comes before I think it comes, that's not going to benefit me any. I'm just going to be unprepared for that to happen. And so that's, you know, when Paul says that, you know, we he focused on the every day. You know, he had his own trials, right? He had people rejecting him just as, just as much. But he finished the race. He fought the good fight. And he kept the word of faith. So, what confidence did Paul express as a believer in these promises? And this honestly, this gives us assurance too. Because when you see that, Paul's no different from us. You know, Paul was on this earth just, as, just like we were. He fought his battles just like we do. You know, he was human just like we are. There's no difference. Why can't we be like Paul? You know, Paul had that confidence. He lived his entire... You know, <clears throat> when you see the stuff that Paul went through, who was he before? No, it's the first year of the church. Yeah. Right, 
he persecuted the church. He was wicked. Very wicked. Very wicked. And you look at that and you think, God forgave him. Right. God forgave him. But it didn't happen immediately. Right? He had to change his whole lifestyle. He had to change everything. And he did. Right? And how, how easy do you think his life, or how hard do you think his life was after that? A lot harder. You know, you gotta, you got to think. He's not just starting from, from the ground. You know, he's not just starting from zero. You know how much trust he has lost? And the ways that he is persecuted, you know, with his life prior to what happened on the road to the, you know, on his life prior to that, he was persecuting and he was, little by little, he was losing a lot of trust. And so nobody really wanted to talk to him. So he had to start earning that and he had to work twice as hard. But what happens in verse 7 here? Even though he had to work twice as hard, it, it's not impossible. He still did. He realized that it was a race, and that's why he says that in verse 7. He realized, he realized if he was patient, and if he did exactly what God told him to do, everything was going to end up in his favor. And then that gives us reassurance, because after what Paul went through, persecuting Christians and becoming an apostle... You know, his whole life, and then at the end of it, he has all that confidence as a believer in God. Yes, sir. You know, even after Paul saw Jesus Christ in the apostle, and he asked three times if that stubborn would be thrown be taken from him, and he says, No, my grace is sufficient for you. And then all the things that he's recorded that he went through, and then he still considers that his light affliction. And if he can get through it and go through all that stuff and consider the light affliction and still have the attitude that he has right here, I thought the faith, the brother race, I thought the fight, and I know it's a promise to me, not just to me, but for all those that love us appearing. Well, when Jesus comes out of the sky, I hope we love us appearing because if we're in the right condition, we will love us appearing. But if we're not in the right condition, we're not going to like that appearing. Right, we have to be. We have to be prepared for that moment to come. You know, like you say, it could be any moment. <clears throat> that return could happen at any point. So we have to be ready. I think I just saw a hand back here. Paul says it best when he says in Romans 8, 18. Romans 8, 18. For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that we have. You know, <clears throat> when you read that verse, <clears throat> the suffering compared at this time you know, not worth comparing with the glory. You know, and that that sums it up. His whole his whole life was like that. And what about Jesus, the sufferings that he went through? You know, not only is death, but to be the Son of God and, and you're rejected. To be the Son of God and your father's rejected. Right? But what was his message? And, and that's the second part of that verse is, is what we can see with what Jesus was teaching is that it's not worth comparing with the glory that is revealed to us, right? Because that glory that is revealed to us, as you mentioned earlier, John 14, it's beautiful. Right? That's the first one. So that glory that we have seen you know, that reward, that ultimate reward after it's all said and done. You know, it's a little bit of it is described and it's just, <clears throat> are we going to go through sufferings? All who don't yeah, and all who desire to live God in Christ Jesus 
will suffer persecution. So there's the answer. <laughs> yeah. What did you say? Are we what? Are we going to suffer? Yeah. Right. Everybody. Everybody goes through it. Yeah. And.